Welcome to Greenway Miles training presentation, What Trucking Company Executives Need to Know About Carbon Dioxide Emissions. Greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide are a major concern around the world and at home. A growing number of foreign leaders, state and local governments, and executives from S&P 500 companies are passing regulations, developing policy, and committing resources to reduce greenhouse gases. Shippers, many of which operate in foreign countries with emission regulations already in place, are increasingly looking for carbon footprint reduction solutions from their logistics partners in North America. While trucking company executives are well aware of the growing concern over greenhouse gases, many do not have the level of understanding needed to intelligently discuss with their customers the science, politics, and reduction strategies associated with carbon dioxide emissions. This training presentation provides that understanding. We'll begin our discussion with greenhouse gases. Ever since life began on our planet, heat from the sun passed through our atmosphere, warmed the land and oceans, and then reflected back out towards space. However, some of that reflected heat becomes trapped by certain gases in the atmosphere and radiated back towards Earth, further warming the planet. These gases are called greenhouse gases because of the greenhouse-like warming effect they have on our planet. Greenhouse gases are essential to our existence. Without them, our planet would be too cold to sustain life as we know it. There are 11 basic gases in Earth's atmosphere, the most abundant being nitrogen and oxygen. Of these 11 gases, Five are considered greenhouse gases because of their ability to prevent reflected heat from returning to space. We will discuss the two most significant greenhouse gases, water vapor and carbon dioxide. Water vapor is by far the most significant greenhouse gas in terms of both volume and insulating effect. Water vapor enters the atmosphere when ground and ocean waters evaporate. When water vapor cools, it returns to the earth as rain. Water vapor can comprise up to 4% of total atmospheric gases based on current weather conditions and acts like a thermal blanket trapping reflected heat and warming the planet. The second greenhouse gas we will discuss and the gas that is the focus of our training is carbon dioxide. The significance of carbon dioxide and its impact on our planet's climate is best understood by explaining what is called the carbon cycle. All living things are made of carbon. Carbon is also a part of the oceans, the air, and the land. Carbon is constantly on the move and the same carbon atoms are used repeatedly throughout nature as carbon rotates between the land, oceans, and atmosphere in what is called the carbon cycle. Here's how it works. Plants and trees live and grow by taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and giving off oxygen in a process called photosynthesis. Through that process, the carbon taken in from the atmosphere becomes part of the plant. When plants die, they decompose into the soil, slowly releasing their stored carbon back into the atmosphere. Or they become buried and after millions of years turn into deep underground deposits of carbon-based fossil fuels such as coal and oil. The ocean also plays a key role in the carbon cycle. Plankton, tiny free-floating surface plants, also use photosynthesis to live and grow, taking carbon dioxide out of the air and giving off oxygen. For millions of years, Earth's carbon cycle remained in balance. The amount of carbon placed into the atmosphere was approximately equal 
to the amount of carbon taken out of the atmosphere. And then, beginning about 250 years ago, two significant events started to influence that balance. Those two events are the Industrial Revolution and deforestation. The Industrial Revolution began in the mid-1700s when humankind first invented machines that burned fossil fuels, making it possible to power factories in various modes of transportation. Burning fossil fuel releases carbon into Earth's atmosphere and oceans that previously was stored deep in the Earth for millions of years. Deforestation is the permanent loss of forests and woodlands caused by the large-scale cutting down of trees to clear land for farming or to sell the timber as a cash crop. Much of the deforestation is occurring in the rainforest of South America and Africa. Rainforest once covered 14% of the Earth's surface. Now they cover only 6%, greatly reducing the amount of trees available to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Together, these two events continue to force a growing imbalance in the carbon cycle as increasing amounts of carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels enters our atmosphere during a time when fewer and fewer trees remain to absorb those emissions. As the concentration of carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere and oceans, our planet becomes warmer. This process is called global warming. Scientists have confirmed the relationship between atmospheric carbon dioxide and global temperature by examining cores of ice that came from deep within glaciers. These ice cores have annual rings formed from seasonal melting and freezing, similar to tree rings, that tell the age of the ice between each ring. Air bubbles trapped in these ice core sections have preserved the history of our atmosphere. By examining these air bubbles, scientists were able to plot carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere in corresponding global temperature going back 400,000 years. As you can see by the chart, the higher the carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere, the warmer the average global temperature. According to scientific data from these ice cores, carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere never exceeded 300 parts per million during the 400,000 year period examined until we entered the 20th century. Then the trend changed and changed drastically. Carbon dioxide not only started to exceed 300 parts per million, but as of 2012, we are now very close to 400 parts per million. In the last 125 years, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased by 33% from its previous high of 300 parts per million. As a result, Earth's average temperature has increased by about 1 degree Fahrenheit. Now a 1 degree Fahrenheit change in average global temperature may not sound like much, but during the most recent ice age, Average global temperature was only 7 degrees colder than it is today, and glaciers covered most of North America. We'll discuss shortly the drastic effect our recent 1 degree change in average global temperature has had on our planet's weather, and how those changes impact virtually every species that lives on our planet. The carbon dioxide content of our oceans is also a concern. Carbon dioxide enters oceans through two main processes. The first is through plankton, often referred to as algae, performing photosynthesis by breathing in carbon dioxide and exhaling oxygen. Plankton put as much oxygen into the atmosphere as do all the trees of the world combined. Like trees, Plankton retain the carbon they breathe in and use it to grow. Plankton is a major food source for all sizes of aquatic life, and so their carbon content is passed along the food chain 
to everything from snails to whales. Carbon dioxide also enters the oceans through surface agitation from wind and rain. Agitation forces carbon to dissolve in the water and it is then used by shellfish to make their shells. As aquatic creatures die, some of their remains sink to the ocean bottom where their carbon can be stored for hundreds of years or longer. Oceans cover over 70% of the Earth's surface and their importance in controlling atmospheric carbon dioxide content in our planet's climate cannot be understated. Scientists estimate that oceans store 50 times the carbon that is currently in our atmosphere. Unfortunately, like our atmosphere, our ocean's carbon content has increased drastically over the last 200 years. Scientists estimate that up to 50% of the carbon dioxide emitted by fossil fuels has been absorbed by our oceans. Increased carbon levels have made our oceans about 30% more acidic than they were before we started burning fossil fuels. Increased acidity reduces the ability of shellfish to make protective shells and bleaches out coral reefs that are so vital to many of the ocean life forms. All of the Earth's oceans are connected by a global circulation system that involves both surface and deep water circulation patterns. As surface waters head towards the poles, they give off retained heat, start to cool, and then sink deep into the ocean. As deep water currents return to warmer climates, they start to rise, give off cool air, and once again become warm surface currents. This global circulation of oceans regulates regional temperatures and precipitation patterns. Oceans have an amazing capacity to absorb excess heat from the atmosphere. The top few meters of an ocean stores as much heat as Earth's entire atmosphere and it is estimated that oceans have absorbed 80 to 90 percent of the increased heat from fossil fuels. However, our oceans are warming and that soon will have a major impact on climate for several reasons. As oceans warm, they have less ability to absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Warmer oceans have quicker evaporation rates resulting in more frequent and more severe weather events and warmer oceans force changes in the global circulation patterns that regulate regional temperature and precipitation. As mentioned earlier, in the last 200 years, average global temperature has increased by one degree Fahrenheit, resulting in significant changes in weather patterns. Changes in weather patterns as a result of global warming are called climate change. According to the United Nations World Meteorological Organization, 13 of the warmest years recorded have occurred within the last 15 years, resulting in significant climate changes. Glaciers across the world are melting, and that's causing several problems. The first is that glacial ice reflects heat back into space. As glaciers melt, total ice surface diminishes and therefore less heat is reflected. Glacial melting and the natural expansion of ocean waters due to warmer temperatures force rising sea levels and threaten coastal areas. The EPA estimates that in the last century worldwide sea levels have risen four to eight inches. Scientists from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predict that based on current warming trends by the end of the 21st century, sea levels will rise three feet, greatly changing our planet's coastlines. As oceans warm, weather becomes more severe due to more frequent evaporation and changes in ocean currents. According to the National Center for Atmospheric Research, Category 4 and 5 hurricanes have increased by 80% in the last 30 years. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change states that global warming is responsible for severe heat waves blamed for more than 50,000 deaths in Europe. 
Our changing climate is changing habitats around the world. Life forms not able to adapt could face extinction. Rising acidity in our oceans is bleaching out coral reefs that are vital to the entire ocean's ecosystems. Polar bears have become the poster child of threatened species as they are drowning in their own habitat due to glacial melting forcing them to swim farther between ice flows to hunt, sometimes as far as 30 miles. Warmer climates allow disease-carrying insects to spread further across the globe. Mosquitoes carrying Da Nang fever used to dwell at elevations no higher than 3,300 feet, but because of warmer temperatures have recently been detected at 7,200 feet in Colombia's Andes Mountains. And biologists have found malaria carrying mosquitoes at higher than usual elevations in Indonesia in just the last several years. According to a team of health and climate scientists at the World Health Organization, global warming and climate change already contribute to more than 150,000 deaths and 5 million illnesses annually, and those numbers could double by 2030. Most of these events are attributable to the spread of infectious diseases such as malaria and Denang fever, heat waves, floods, extreme weather, and malnutrition caused by changing habitats. Now that we have a general understanding of greenhouse gases, global warming, and climate change, let's look at the trucking industry and their contribution to carbon dioxide emissions. The annual amount of carbon dioxide emissions a trucking company emits is referred to as their carbon footprint. Greenhouse gas protocol, which is the global standard used to define and measure carbon footprints, breaks emissions into two sources, direct and indirect. Direct emissions are emissions from sources that are owned or controlled by a specific company. Indirect emissions are emissions that are a consequence of the activities of the company but occur at sources owned or controlled by another entity. Additionally, emissions are also placed into three categories called scopes. Scope 1 emissions include all direct carbon dioxide emissions such as the burning of fuel in trucks owned or operated by a trucking company. Scope 2 emissions include indirect carbon dioxide emissions from consumption of purchased electricity, heat, or steam. Scope 3 emissions are all other indirect emissions, such as the production of purchased materials and fuels, transport related activities in vehicles not owned or controlled, outsourced activities, waste disposal, etc. The carbon footprint of a for hire trucking company equals the sum of their Scope 1 and Scope 2 carbon dioxide emissions. These emissions are generally from fuel burned in company owned and operated trucks, fuel burned by owner operators under lease to the company, direct and indirect utility usage at facilities, and emissions from company operated service vehicles. The carbon footprint of a for hire trucking company is considered a scope 3 emission for manufacturers and shippers. To them, contracted for transport activities generate indirect emissions because they don't own or control the assets that are emitting the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide. However, for private fleets owned and controlled by a manufacturer or shipper, Emissions from owned and controlled fleet operations are part of their carbon footprint, as are all Scope 1 and Scope 2 emissions associated with manufacturing their products. So, how much carbon dioxide does a trucking company actually emit? To answer that question, we'll look at the carbon dioxide emission volume of one typical heavy-duty truck that travels 80,000 miles per year and burns 12,121 gallons of diesel fuel. Over the course of a year, 
that truck will emit 123 metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions. The image of a man standing in a cube represents one metric ton. Multiply that by 123 and you will have the volume of carbon dioxide gas emitted by a typical heavy duty truck. Here's a few other comparisons to help visualize just how significant carbon dioxide emissions from trucking operations are. For every mile driven, our typical heavy duty truck will give off a volume of carbon dioxide emissions that would fill a 150 gallon fuel tank. For every hour our typical truck idles, it emits a volume of carbon dioxide gas that would fill a standard size day cab. And another way to visualize the volume of emissions from one year of operations is that for each year of operation our typical heavy duty truck will give off a volume of carbon dioxide emissions that would completely fill 656 53 foot trailers. As concerning as it is to visualize the amount of carbon dioxide emissions just one truck emits each year, consider this. There are approximately 3 million heavy duty trucks operating in North America alone. Earlier, we explained that the carbon cycle is out of balance. The trucking industry provides an excellent example of why that imbalance has occurred. Huge amounts of carbon stored in fossil fuels, once buried deep within the earth, are being released into the atmosphere and oceans as we burn that fuel to power our trucks. The EPA estimates that in 2010, the transportation sector alone emitted a total of 1.8 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. So what exactly is being done about carbon dioxide emissions and global warming? Let's start with a global perspective. In December of 1997, at the city of Kyoto, Japan, a legally binding international treaty was negotiated called the Kyoto Protocol. Under the treaty, industrialized countries agreed to reduce their emissions of greenhouse gases compared to the base year of 1990. National targets were established for each participating country to reduce emissions by the year 2012 in hopes of limiting further global warming to 2 degrees, a threshold that once crossed most believe will bring disastrous environmental consequences. When the Kyoto Protocol went into effect on February 16, 2005, 141 countries had ratified it. As of August 2011, 191 countries have ratified the treaty. The United States, however, ended up not ratifying the agreement, claiming it would hurt their economy too much, and that the agreement was flawed because large undeveloped countries, such as China, India, and Brazil, were not bound by the agreement. Symbolically, the Kyoto Protocol is an important document. The signatures of leaders from 191 countries serve as international acknowledgement that greenhouse gases are causing our planet to warm, are changing our weather patterns, and are threatening life forms everywhere. The international community is in agreement. Global warming is real and it needs to be reversed. Unfortunately, the Kyoto Protocol has not reduced total global carbon emissions. According to the European Union's Joint Research Center, global carbon dioxide emissions increased by 45 percent between 1990 and 2010, reaching an all-time high of 33 billion tons. Much of the increase came from the developing countries of China and India. There are, however, some positive results. As of the end of 2010, the EU 15 countries are on course to meet or exceed their 8% emission reduction target and the EU 27 countries are approximately 15.5% below their 1990 level. 
The success of the European Union countries in reducing carbon emissions is the result of several initiatives. Perhaps most effective is the emissions trading system founded in 2002 that limits the amount of carbon dioxide key industries such as steel, cement, and paper and cardboard production companies can emit. The emissions trading system uses a cap and trade principle. Companies that operate below their specified limit, called the cap, receive emission allowances they can trade or sell. The European Union has always played a leadership position regarding greenhouse gas emission control and was instrumental in bringing together the countries that negotiated the Kyoto Protocol. The European Union is committed to even further emission reductions and by 2020 plan to be 20 percent below their 1990 emission levels. In the United States, federal efforts to pass cap and trade legislation failed in the Senate in 2010. As a result, federal legislation to reduce carbon emissions has focused mainly on higher MPG requirements for new passenger and heavy duty vehicles. Additionally, in 2004, the federal government created SmartWay, EPA's voluntary program that partners with trucking companies to provide annual fleet emission reporting and education on fuel conservation strategies. While federal efforts to regulate carbon emissions remain weak, state and local governments are aggressively stepping up their efforts. States across the country have banded into regional alliances focused on developing emission policy supported by cap and trade legislation. California recently approved a state regulated cap and trade program designed to support earlier legislation that requires that state to reduce emissions to 1990 levels by 2010. Municipal governments are also aggressively pursuing emission reductions. In February of 2005, the same month the Kyoto Protocol went into effect, 141 mayors from cities across the country signed the Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement, pledging to reduce greenhouse gases in their communities by 7 percent and to petition the federal government to embrace climate change legislation. There are now over 1,000 cities signatory to that agreement. The private sector is also embracing carbon dioxide emission reduction opportunities. Walmart has become the industry leader in adapting technology and process to improve the MPG of their private fleet, thereby reducing both fuel costs and emissions. Other U.S. companies, such as IBM, Hewitt-Packard, and Sprint, have also made significant progress in their carbon reduction efforts, earning them the distinction of being the top three U.S. green companies in Newsweek's 2011 green rankings. According to the 2012 Carbon Disclosure Project, in 2011, 87 percent of the 335 S&P top 500 companies that responded to their survey now publicly report their greenhouse gas emissions, while 65 percent stated that climate change issues are integrated into their overall business strategies. The Carbon Disclosure Project also surveyed members regarding their supply chain. Survey results determined that 90 percent of responding companies have a climate change strategy. 62 percent of the corporations currently reward their suppliers for their good carbon management practices and half of the respondent companies are developing a contractual obligation for suppliers to manage greenhouse gas emissions. There is little doubt remaining in the scientific, political, and business communities that carbon dioxide emissions are forcing global warming and having disastrous effects. Foreign leaders, state and local governments, and business executives are all taking actions to reduce emissions. So what should trucking company executives do about their company's carbon dioxide emissions? Step one 
is to simply learn and commit. Learn all you can about greenhouse gases, global warming and climate change, so that you can intelligently discuss the issues and solutions with employees and customers, and then commit to providing your company the direction needed to reduce emissions and become a sustainability leader in the trucking industry. Step two is to baseline, monitor, and report your carbon footprint. Like any aspect of your operations, you cannot improve what you do not measure. Contract with a reputable third-party provider for annual carbon audits. The first audit will serve as your baseline, while subsequent audits will allow you to monitor emission reduction progress. Keep in mind, your carbon footprint includes both fleet and facility operations. Finally, report results to your shippers. Carbon audits can provide carbon footprint reporting on several levels, on a total company basis, on a per mile basis, on an individual shipper basis, or even on a trip basis. Reporting carbon emissions is an excellent marketing tool. Think of the marketing and goodwill opportunity available from enabling your sales team to call upon each customer to see if they want individual trip carbon emissions data to accompany each EDI shipment record. Step three is to develop a detailed carbon emissions reduction plan. Your emission reduction plan should include specific emission goals and a comprehensive list of activities to reduce emissions of both your fleet and your facilities. Examples of emission reduction activities include use of technology and aerodynamic design within your fleet, teaching fuel conserving driving techniques, idle control, setback thermostats, and high efficiency lighting fixtures and bulbs. Many more activities can be found on the web, EPA's SmartWay website, or provided by a professional sustainability expert. Also, consider assigning high-level accountability for plan management to improve performance results. Step four is to educate employees, shippers, and vendors. Employee education is not a one-size-fits-all process. For example, this training presentation may be a good fit for your management team, but perhaps too comprehensive for your driver group. Carbon emission training for drivers should center more on how drivers influence carbon emissions when behind the wheel. Most companies already encourage drivers to conserve fuel, but emission reduction training that incorporates motivation to save the planet for our grandchildren versus simply saving the company fuel cost could be far more effective. Employee education should also include non-work opportunities. Use your carbon emission reduction training sessions to encourage employees to conserve fuel and utility usage in their personal lives also. Shipper training will be indirectly initiated through carbon footprint reporting. Done properly, your reporting activities will cause many of your customers to come calling to learn more about your emission reporting and reduction activities. Vendors also need to be included. Their training should focus on your company's expectations of them when it comes to carbon emissions. Encourage vendors to develop their own emission reduction plans and to provide you a copy each year. Step five is to embrace other sustainability activities. This training presentation has focused on carbon dioxide emission reduction as that is by far trucking's most environmentally damaging impact. However, your company should also develop effective plans for recycling, water conservation, generating zero waste, and preventing contaminants from entering our streams. Our final step is to develop and publish a sustainability plan that incorporates the details of steps one through five. 
provide a downloadable copy on your website. Publishing a formal sustainability plan not only documents your company's commitment to environmental stewardship, but it also serves as an influence for others in the trucking industry to take similar actions. Thank you for viewing Greenway Miles presentation, What Trucking Company Executives Need to Know About Carbon Dioxide Emissions. We hope you found it of value. Carbon dioxide emissions, global warming, and climate change are an increasingly serious threat to our planet. Please use your influence to not only reduce the environmental impact of your company's operations, but to educate and mentor other trucking industry professionals about how they too can make a difference. If you have any questions about this presentation or would like to discuss your company's sustainability program, please give us a call. Thank you.